All right, good afternoon. Uh, welcome to today's event on the future, or sorry, on the evolution of digital content. It's also the future of digital content. Um, uh, my name is Daniel Castro. I'm a senior analyst here at the Information Technology and Innovation Foundation. Um, I'd like to welcome everyone who's joining us via our live webcast. Uh, today's event is also being video recorded, uh, and the video will be put on our website following the event if you'd like to share it with anyone. Uh, we're going to be doing questions at the end of the panel uh, discussion. If you'd like to uh, raise a question in the room, you can. You can also participate via Twitter using the hashtag ITIF. Just want to make a few framing remarks before we begin. Um, over the past decade, we've seen a surge in the availability of legal digital content. And much of this innovation has been on the technology side, with streaming sites like Hulu and Netflix, e-commerce sites and platforms like iTunes and Google Play, and mobile devices like the iPad. But we've also seen a lot of really interesting innovation on the business side of digital content, with many companies finding new ways to provide affordable content to consumers through different business models. And so to discuss these trends, we have an excellent set of panelists here today. Uh, starting on my immediate left, uh, we have Zahava Levine, who is the head of content partnership for Google Play. Uh, David Israelite, president and CEO of the National Music Publishers Association. Lee Knight, Executive Director of the Digital Media Association, and John McCoskey, Executive Vice President and Chief Technology Officer of the Motion Picture Association of America. And what I've asked is for each of them to spend a few minutes this afternoon talking to us about how the market for digital content has changed and will likely change over the next few years, as well as the impact that this has had on consumers and on businesses. Uh, so to how about, why don't we start with you? Sure. Um, well, thank you very much for, for inviting me here today. It's nice to be here. Uh, my name is Zahava, as uh, Dan said, and I'm the director of Google Content Partnerships for Google Play. I've been at Google for about seven years. Oh, sorry. I've been at uh, Google for about seven years. Uh, the first four or so years were with YouTube. I was the chief counsel of YouTube working on developing their business model and copyright tools. And the last few years, I moved over to the Android business unit when I've been focused on developing uh, a new content model called Google Play. Um, I think in my time at Google, we've seen a mass proliferation of legal content services globally. And I think there's two major impacts that are, uh, two major impacts. First is increased revenue for content creators. Uh, for example, in music, in the music industry in 2012, for the first time, uh, over 50% of recorded music sales in 2012 were digital. Of, of recorded music revenues, I should say, is from digital revenues. Uh, and I think globally, it's up to 34%. So, and then the other is, of course, enhanced compelling content offerings for consumers. For the first time, consumers can now generally obtain uh, almost any content they like wherever they like, whether they're at home, on their tablet, on their phone, or on their computers, um, in, uh, um, uh, in, a, in a convenient way, how, whenever they want it. I guess that's the big thing, whenever they want it, uh, subject to some windowing, but for the most part. Um, and I think that these services create a great alternative for users to piracy. Um, we've already seen in Sweden, there's a study that with the growth of the Spotify subscription service, uh, there's a corresponding decrease in uh, piracy of about 25% in, in, you know, that was like a study coming out of Europe. Um, so anyway, in terms of com new compelling digital content services, I think Google has contributed with two major initiatives. One was YouTube and the next is Google Play. With YouTube, just very briefly, that has had an astonishing growth trajectory in terms of uh, digital revenues. YouTube now has over a million channels, partner channels, generating revenue uh, for content creators. And thousands of these channels are generating over $100,000 a year for content creators. YouTube is paying the music industry alone hundreds of millions of dollars a year and um, has offered some very sophisticated uh, tools that we developed called content identification technology, which enables you, uh, content creators to monetize user uploaded videos. It enables them to automatically identify the content in, that, in those user uploaded videos that may belong to them, and then to choose whether to remove that content from the site or to monetize it. 
and YouTube now has over 4,000 partners using these tools to monetize user uploaded videos on YouTube. So uh, it, uh, in general, that's been an, an incredible success story. Um, there's a Google Play is a much newer service. It's uh, really, I guess, launched in 2011. Um, and is a little lesser known. So I'd like to take just a, my remaining few minutes to talk about uh, Google Play. It's been uh, an ambitious undertaking with all different, well, let me, let me just tell you what it is. Um, so Google Play is a, a premium uh, entertainment service that enables users to get all their digital entertainment content from, from one place. And that includes movies and TV, books, games, apps, magazines, and music. And it's all available on the web or on any Android device. Um, the content that is purchased on Google Play, so you can search for content on Google Play and, and then purchase it. Content that's purchased is stored in the cloud, which means that if you buy it on the web, it's immediately and instantaneously available on your phone. If you buy it on your phone, it's immediately instantaneously available on your tablet. So it's you buy it, it's stored in the cloud, it's available everywhere for con convenient uh, access. Google Play has, been, ha has, has grown along with Android itself. So Android now has a billion activated, there's, there's over a billion activated Android devices in the world. There's 1.5 new Android devices are activated every single day. We're in 190 countries um, and everybody that has uh, an Android phone, an Android smartphone that wants to get apps to use on that smartphone needs to go to Google Play. So over 80% of Android users are going to Google Play. We take the huge traffic from apps and then try to you know, re take advantage of that traffic to, to redirect re, uh, them to other content categories like music and movies to generate revenue. Just to put it all in perspective, how new Google Play is, you can see here, you know, iTunes has been around for about 13 years, uh, Amazon for about six years. Android launched the, its app store, the Android market, in 2008, but Google Play as a unified content uh, platform was launched in 2011, so it's really quite new. Um, and we're very excited to be introducing new competition into the marketplace, which gives users choice and uh, also creates a very healthy licensing environment from a content creator perspective. We've expanded quite a bit. You can see for each content vertical here what countries we've launched in. So apps is, is the most developed, it's been around the longest, but movies and music and, and uh, books have also expanded quite a bit internationally, giving US industries, international, you know, global markets. Uh, our goal with Google Play is just to make purchasing seamless and convenient. So whether you're on your, your, your PC or on your phone, we just want a one-click purchase experience. Uh, if, if we were working, you know, we have a lot of credit cards on file, but for, we also have direct carrier billing options. So we have deals with the carriers where you can just click and, and bill the content that you want to your carrier bill. It goes on to your Verizon bill or whatever. We also have uh, gift cards for people that may not have credit cards. So the vast majority of the revenue that we bring in, well, I should start by saying our revenue has increased in, in just the digital content uh, vertical. So music, movies, uh, books, our revenue has increased three times year over year from 2012 to 2013. And um, the vast majority of the money that we bring in goes to the content creators, our licensors. We have deals in place with all of the major music record companies, all of the major music publishers, with David's help, thank you very much, uh, all of the major book publishers, and as well, of course, as millions of independents. Um, we have something called the Artist Hub, which enables an aspiring young musician, for example, to upload their music, their original music, directly to Google Play and sell it directly to uh, fans through Google Play. Um, okay, and just really brief on each of the content verticals. So this is our music. music. Our music offering has three components. First, there's a music store, which sells over 18 million songs. Um, 
And we also have a licensed scan and match music locker, which enables users to upload their pre-existing music collections into the cloud and access uh, it from any internet connection or, any, or offline on any Android device. And we also recently introduced the all access music subscription service, which is a, a music subscription service, all the music in the world for uh, about $10 a month. For movies and TVs, we have you know, thousands of movies and TV shows available for purchase or for rent, um, including HD quality uh, movies, which have become very popular lately. We have, for books, the world's largest selection of ebooks, more than 5 million titles. And we recently are excited that we recently just added textbooks. Uh, users can buy textbooks or they can rent them for six months and get a discount for renting of up to 80%. And magazines, you can either buy single issues or subscribe, so they automatically get sent to you each week or month. And we have a big gaming vertical that has all kinds of social features and allows multiplayer, and you can you know, join into your friends' games and other games and try to compete to get to the top of the leaderboard. I, I think that that's, that's the overview of Google Play. Um, my takeaway from being at Google for seven years and building two huge uh, content businesses is that, in general, the marketplace is working. Um, there are more legal digital options than, than ever before. Um, we are partnering very closely with all of the major uh, content creators and media companies, including and, and millions of independent, aspiring new artists. And um, we hope that Washington, D.C. will continue to support policies that encourage a strong marketplace of digital content services. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, David. So within the, the larger question of digital content, I'm going to focus specifically on music. I represent music publishers and songwriters. And if you look at all the products that are offered on Google Play, whether it be movies, TV shows, books, magazines, apps, video games, Music is unique in, in two fundamental ways. First of all, unlike all of those other products, with music you have two different owners. So you need permissions or negotiations with two different copyright owners, whereas all the other content, you're having a single source negotiation. Because in the music space, you have a copyright that is created and owned by songwriters and music publishers, and then a very separate, distinct copyright that is created and owned by artists and record labels. So that's one of the challenges of music that's unique. The second unique thing about music is it is highly regulated by the government, unlike all of those other products. All of the other products, with that single source negotiation, you negotiate a price in a free market. But with music, you have very heavy government regulation and price setting with regard to the value of the copyrights in digital content. And so because of those two unique things, music becomes very challenging in terms of how you evolve, how you thrive in a digital world. It's, it's important to understand about in the music industry the distinction of those two copyrights and how they're regulated. Most people in this room probably have some familiarity with this, but for music publishers and songwriters, if you're a typical songwriter music publisher, you make 95% of your money in three basic ways. You have mechanical reproductions, which are basically selling copies of recordings. You have performances, which is basically transmitting the song in a public venue, like over radio or television airwaves, in a public place. And you have synchronizations, when you marry the music to a video product. Those three ways that we make 95% of our money are regulated completely differently depending on the type of use. So if it's a mechanical reproduction, which makes up about 34% of our income, it's completely regulated by a compulsory license that's existed since before World War I, and it's a rate standard that we believe is not very friendly to creators. So once you give initial permission to record the song, every time a copy of the song is sold on Google Play or anywhere else, we get 9.1 cents exactly because three judges in Washington, D.C. every five years sit in judgment and tell us what we get. Now that 34% of our income for record labels and their separate copyright is 90% of their income from last year. They're not regulated at all. They're in a total free market. So if you're Google Play and want to have a download store, 
You need permissions from both copyright owners. Your negotiation with the record label over the sound recordings in a free market, but there is no negotiation with the songwriter and music publisher. You go through a trial every five years, and we're told what we get. The other part of our income, which is a performance, which makes up about 32% of our income, is not regulated by law, but most of our industry lives under consent decrees with the Justice Department. For record labels and the other copyright, they have a limited performance right. It's much narrower than ours. It's only for digital performance. But for their performance right, it look, looks like our mechanical. It's a compulsory right. It's set every five years. They generally have a very good rate standard, but completely different operations to get a performance right. And then you look at the synchronization right, which makes up about 29% of our income. For both copyrights, completely unregulated. Record label, music publisher. So when you look at how you evolve a digital marketplace, you start with the challenge by anyone who wants to get into the space of having to get permissions in two different ways and depending on the type of usage, whether it's a reproduction, whether it's a performance, whether it's a synchronization, completely different processes to get those rights. And quite honestly, it makes no sense. It's a very artificial way to do it. It's based in a lot of historical anomaly about how it developed. And as we're looking to empower digital services going forward, I think one of the things that we ought to be looking at is collapsing those rights together into a more simple, easy licensing solution. The tension that exists is to do that, though, it begs the question of whether or not the copyright, the value, is regulated or not. So just to give you an example, the YouTube uh, experience, which was one where Zahab and I actually worked together to provide an industry solution to the problem, is one where there's no mechanical compulsory available. While there is a performance element, it's primarily not a performance-based business model that can take consent decree licenses, but rather it's a synchronization model, where users post video that include music. We don't know what that music is ahead of time, but yet YouTube wants permission ahead of time to license anything that might be posted so they can monetize that video and share some of that money with the songwriter. It's a good thing for everybody involved, but it involves a licensing solution where you have to get voluntary agreements from two different copyright owners and on the publishing side because the ownership is fractured every song may have multiple owners it becomes a very burdensome license licensing regime we're now two years into our agreement with YouTube we have over 4,000 music publishing companies that have licensed YouTube which probably makes up close to a hundred percent of the commercially relevant market but it was really hard to do, as Ahab and I know from experience. It wasn't a simple, we want to do a business that involves synchronizations, here's how you license it. You take more performance-based models, something like internet radio, and while you have a very easy way to license it, digital radio, the problem for songwriters and music publishers isn't about how easy it is to launch, the problem is about the value to us. Because of these consent decrees with the Justice Department, we end up with a situation where if you take, for example, one of the top internet radio companies, Pandora, the money is being split between the two copyrights in a way that songwriters find very unfair. In the last quarter, it was split 14 to 1 because of the separate rate processes using different rules and regulation. And so what you're starting to see is a reaction by many music publishers to try to get out of these consent decree burdens and operate in a free market. Well, what you're doing with that is you're hurting the efficiency of the licensing, where it's been very easy historically to get performance licenses. You go to three places and you're covered to a future where it may be you have many more places to go and it's a much harder licensing regime, but songwriters may find that they get higher value for their copyright. So there's this tension that exists about how do you make licensing easier so that digital models can thrive, but at the same time, protect the value of the intellectual property that's created by a songwriter. And that's something that I think we're trying to figure out, and it's not easy, because they're at odds with each other. Quite honestly, the easiest thing to do, from a licensing perspective, would be to make a single source license from one society or one organization, have the rate set by some government agency. That would be easy to do. It would be terrible for songwriters. The best thing for the value of songwriters would be to have a completely free market negotiation. 
as movies, books, magazines, television, games, apps, all do. No one in the government is telling the creators of that intellectual property the value of their intellectual property. But to get into that free market, you create an enormous licensing problem because of the nature of music. Two different owners and one of the owners having multiple pieces. So the market has reacted to these challenges in different ways. You have lots of digital stores, but it hasn't been easy to license them. There's going to be continued disputes about the value of the intellectual property. And one of the things that I worry about the most is that the type of exciting new business models that really are where we want to go because people aren't going to be buying copies of music I think very much longer. I think that that's going to continue to shrink and we're going to see the business models that involve more the types of things that are being done with the type of locker services, the type of video services that Zahava talked about. That's where the future is going to be but it's harder to do that and we have to figure out a way to make that work. So I've talked about a concept that is fairly controversial, but it's one that I think provides a path forward, which is instead of these artificial distinctions about the type of usage of the copyright, why not just have it be a music right? Doesn't matter if it's a reproduction or a performance or a synchronization or a use of a lyric right, it's simply an exploitation of the copyright of the intellectual property that's owned and created by songwriters and music publishers. If you had that simplicity, it would make it a lot easier to do business models that cross the borders of what you want to do. But the only way that would be embraced by creators is if the value of that right were negotiated in a free market and not something that was set under a bad rate standard by three judges in Washington every five years. So if you're a digital company, you may like the idea of ease of licensing, but you might not like the idea of having to negotiate the value instead of having there be an artificial ceiling on the value of the property. If you're the rights holder, you may like a free market, but you also may be challenged with how you license it. It seems to me that the way that the music industry is regulated deserves unique treatment because of the unique nature of the intellectual property. And so I think it's worth a discussion about antitrust exemptions for music so that there could be free market negotiations, but still the aggregating of the rights together in a collective place. If you look at our performance space, where the market produced three companies that are in the business of licensing performances, ASCAP, BMI, and CSAC, and they do an excellent job of it. And if you're a licensee, you have a very easy time getting performance licenses. You go to three places, you're licensed. But because of the nature of consent decrees, the value has been pressed down so much that you're starting to see a real reaction in the marketplace. So, as a licensing model, performances work, but as a value proposition, I think creators deserve something better. Unlike every other form of this type of digital content that's being sold on Google Play, of having the government weigh in with what the value is of that property. So that's our challenge. It's one that's not going to be easily solved, but until that time, I think what you're seeing is creative ways for the market to respond like what has happened with YouTube, like what's happened with some of the innovative type locker services or streaming services that Google does or that Lee represents. But, I, but the one thing I'd ask you to leave this conversation with is an understanding of the unique nature of music in this conversation and how it may need some special treatment by government in order for the market to work the way that the markets work for other digital content. Am I on? Hi, I'm Lee Knife. I'm the executive director of the Digital Media Association. We're a nonprofit organization here in Washington that represents consumer facing uh, digital media outlets. Uh, in full disclosure, uh, Zahab's organization is one of my members. Um, I think it's important to note, uh, just so that we're perfectly clear, that DEMA only represents copyright respecting, royalty paying entities. Um, so when you talk about DEMA members, you're not talking about anybody who's trying to skirt copyright issues, trying not trying to exploit material without paying for it, um, and those types of things. Pirate organizations are not welcome in DEMA. Um, I have a whole bunch of stuff that I wanted to say, but I actually just wanted to take issue with one of the kind of characterizations that David uh, made just a minute ago, not because I want to take David to task, but just because I want to, I want to be clear about it, and it kind of dovetails into where I think a good portion of this conversation should go. Um, 
it's not entirely true to say that the music industry is unique because any recording of a musical work contains two copyrights. Um, indeed, John's constituency deals with material that they release all of a piece that has many more copyrights incorporated in it than any musical composition or recording thereof has, right? They have script writers, they, m movies themselves include producers, photography, um, they include in fact the music itself which has the, the separate rights that David was talking about. I think the distinction is not that there are multiple rights that are implicated in any particular copyrighted material, it's how those rights get administered, how they get negotiated, how they get paid for, etc. And that's a good portion of what David was talking about. But I just want to be clear that um, music is unique not so much because it has multiple copyrights implicated, but because the nature of the business historically has involved regulation of certain of those rights. Um, and we can say that that's due to anomalies or whatever, but in fact it's due historically in, in many cases to abuses. Um, regarding uh, essentially monopoly power over the negotiation of those rights. All that having been said, um, one of the things, basically the presentation that I wanted to make here was talking about where the, where the digital media marketplace is going. And uh, Daniel had given us a list of questions that started with, you know, how is the, the market for digital content changing? Um, how will these changes affect companies? and how will these changes uh, impact consumers? And when I looked at his list of questions, I actually thought to myself that those questions should probably be almost inverted in that we need to talk first about what consumers are going to demand, not what they're going to be impacted by. I think the days of, of media companies, copyright owners, and media outlets being able to dictate to consumers what they are going to be able to buy and on what terms are long over. Consumers are now voting with their feet and with their mouse clicks as to what they want to consume, where, and how. And what we are seeing, if we observe those trends, is we're seeing a marketplace where consumers continuously seek media on demand, media on demand that is available across a wide spectrum of devices in a, in a large, uh, uh, spectrum of, of contexts. So the idea is that uh, watching movies only in a theater or only in your living room or whatever is no longer really the paradigm that we have to that we have to cater to. People expect to watch movies on tablets, even on their smartphones while they're commuting. Um, likewise, music. The idea of sitting in your living room and staring at your speakers or having a pair of headphones on is is also long over. People want music wherever they are, sometimes in the cloud, sometimes on demand, simply through a wireless device, etc. And so we're seeing consumers dictate to businesses that that's the way they want their media. They want it in piecemeal, they want it when they want it, how they want it, and where they want it. And they want to sometimes produce their own media, um, like YouTube and Vimeo and, and these very, very popular services where people produce their own material. And as Zahava was talking about, Google Play is ideally situated as a business to be able to, to respond to those consumer desires and, and to fulfill them. So if we look at that, and, and we look at that, that's the way, that's, those are the trends that are undeniable and we can see where they're going. Then you, then you get to the question of, well, what is, what is business going to do about that? What, how is that going to affect businesses? And as Daniel said, um, how are those changes going to impact companies' bottom lines? And I think that this now gets me to segue back to a lot of what David was talking about, which is it is an, a requirement to be able to continue to satisfy these consumer demands, that businesses that aggregate copyright, copyright creators themselves, um, and outlets that, that provide copyrighted material to the consumers, that they have to break down their preconceived notions of business models that have existed for the last 50, 60, 70 years and start to cater to new business models. We have to start easing licensing, something that David talked about. We have to start uh, streamlining that process, making it so that a company like Zahava's can go to one place and license essentially a music right and get it for a fair price. Um, I'm not sure that I'm absolutely concerned um, with 
the tensions that David was talking about between having an easy licensing environment and making sure that there's adequate compensation for the creative right that's being negotiated over would uh, necessarily grind that system to a halt. I, I think that there are, we have models, uh, uh, you know, MPAAs, member companies, our service, amp, ample ones. Um, within the music industry yourself, we have them. We have the Harry Fox Agency. We have other centralized organizations, like David was talking about, the performing rights organizations. People who have widely disparate rights that want to license them on a broad scale tend to have the wisdom to be able to move into collective uh, uh, negotiating bodies by themselves, with or without governmental intervention. But I think that's really what we have to talk about, <coughs> what we have to anticipate, and what media companies need to start to do is to embrace a different business landscape than the one that they have historically had, and that unfortunately over the last few years they've uh, tried to jealously protect. They have to start uh, engaging in more experimental type of revenue sharing uh, scenarios, like percentage of revenue versus just a penny rate on, on various items, uh, participating in advertising, all of these types of things. They need to embrace a wider spectrum of potential business models and to see what works and what doesn't work and stop trying to sell a particular boxed item that they were able to sell in 1967 to the same consumer in 2013 when that the consumer doesn't want that and has stated pretty clearly with their behavior that that's not what they want. Um, I think that's really it. Great. Uh, thanks, Lee. Thanks, Lee. Well, thanks to the ITIF for uh, hosting this event. I think it's a really relevant topic, and I'm uh, pleased to be on the panel with, with my colleagues here. So when we think about you know, how is the market for digital content changing, first of all, you have to start with quality content. So in order to attract visitors to your website or subscribers to your service or eyeballs to your advertisements, you have to start with that compelling content. And recent marketplace developments bear this out. MPAAs, member companies, uh, continue to be at the cutting edge of e the evolution of that digital content. And our industry is experimenting with new products and services every day to deliver our content to consumers when, where, and how they want it, exactly what my colleagues have talked about. Examples include the award-winning services like HBO Go, Crackle, and Hulu, and many others. Also, the ultraviolet technology standard that came out of the movie industry allows consumers to buy content in one format, store it in the cloud, and consume it across devices and platforms when they choose. And TV Everywhere allows pay TV subscribers to access much of their content online and at no additional cost as well. And in fact, there are now over 400 legal online platforms to consume our content, 95 of those in the US alone. Recently, MPAA launched a website called wheretowatch.org that details all these legal options so consumers have a place to find legal content online. There are many other examples of the dramatic changes in the industry with, with, uh, in, with digital content. You know, Jeff Bezos' recently acquisition of, of the Washington Post. eBay founder uh, Pierre Omidar announced he's going to back a journalistic venture by Glenn, Glenn Greenwald. Netflix is producing its own award-winning content like House of Cards, Orange is the New Black, and recently announced a deal with MPA member Sony Pictures to, to produce a yet-to-be-titled show. They're also in talks with cable providers to app, add their app to the set-top box. Amazon's now producing a wide range of original programming on their own. And Yahoo is rumored to be in talks with Katie Couric to produce content exclusively for their web properties. And Twitter, in partnerships with leading content producers, is highlighting the integration of their social media platform with the TV viewing experience as they approach their IPO. So an awful lot of different things happening in the digital space. A lot of experimentation, a lot of innovation going on. There's an explosion of new content and ways in which to consume it, and these are being announced nearly every day. All of this experimentation and innovation is indicative of a highly functioning and competitive market that's developing compelling content, distributing it in new ways, and experimenting with new business models to meet consumer demand. <coughs> we welcome this marketplace innovation and expect to be leading participants as it continues to evolve in order to deliver our world-leading content consumers when, where, and how they want it. So with that kind of change in, in the um, digital landscape, how will these changes have impacts on companies' bottom line? So what does this mean to the business? Well, in our view, a competitive and safe marketplace that continues to incentivize creators, 
and to innovate and develop new and exciting content, and as well as distribute it in consumer-friendly ways, represents a tremendous opportunity for content creators. Every MPA company has a robust digital strategy targeted to capitalizing on these opportunities and to meet consumer demands. Unfortunately, piracy remains a persistent problem. In fact, a recent study by NetNames concluded that in North America, Europe, Europe and Asia Pacific, absolute infringing bandwidth use increased by almost 160 percent between 2010 and 2012. And this figure represents almost 24 percent of the total bandwidth used by all internet users, residential and commercial, in those three regions. To give you a real world example, The Walking Dead was pirated 500,000 times within 16 hours despite the fact that it was available to stream for free the next 27 days on AMC's website and distributed in 125 countries around the world the day after it aired. To our industry, which takes considerable risks in producing movies and TV shows, this is still a troubling trend. To give you a sense of the investment and risk associated with our industry, the average studio production costs over $100 million, and only two in 10 movies actually recoup their costs at the box office. Even after factoring in, in ancil ancillary revenue streams such as licensing, product placements, etc., six in ten movies still never make a dime. In order to address online theft, we believe that private sector collaboration can make a meaningful difference. Private sector efforts such as the Copyright Alert System, which is a partnership between the major ISPs and the movie and music industries, which alerts consumers they've accessed, accessed illegal content and helps guide them to legal content sources demonstrates that the stakeholders in the industry in the econo in internet ecosystem can collaborate in good faith in an effort to achieve meaningful results. If we're going to create a safe, secure, and sustainable internet for viewers in the economy by supplementing copyright enforcement with voluntary multi-stakeholder efforts, all parties must work together in a meaningful way to, to minimize support in inadvertent or otherwise for content distributed without authorizations. If stakeholders can work together to ensure that all the participants benefit from a safe, competitive, innovative marketplace, companies will continue to be rewarded on the basis of the quality of their products and services. And we believe that this dynamic can only be good for the bottom lines of companies that deliver the best content with the ultimate benefit of high quality content and delivery accruing to consumers. So to Lee's point, the consumers are really the key here. How will these changes ultimately impact consumers? It's an exciting time to be in the digital content space, and consumers stand to benefit greatly from changes in the video marketplace. As noted earlier, every day there is a new story about new partnership, service, technology, or content offering that's enabled by the Internet. However, to ensure that content creators continue to be incentivized to create all the content that drives the growth of the Internet, all the stakeholders in the Internet ecosystem need to work together in order to ensure that consumers continue to benefit from the best content and viewing experience possible. Thanks. Thanks, John. Um, I want to open it up for some discussion here on the panel. I think, uh, David, let me start with you. Um, you talked a, a lot about the, the differences uh, in what you saw between music and other content. So can you maybe walk us through some of the differences in terms of outcomes for the consumer in what you see for that? Or maybe, you know, in Lee's terms, what are the expectations of the consumer in music versus video, and where's the gap difference? Sure. And I, I think Lee missed my point. I'm not suggesting that other forms of digital content don't have bundled copyrights. What I'm saying is that music is unique in that for the digital licensee, they have to go through two separate copyright negotiations and payments unlike any other form. So if Google Play wants to sell movies, they have one discussion and there's one payment made. But if Google Play wants to do something with music, it has to deal with two separate copyright owners. So it's not that movies and books and other things don't have bundled copyrights, it's that music is unique in that you have to deal with those two copyrights separately, which presents a much bigger headache, a much bigger challenge to how to make it work. The other thing that's different is that it's not as if you have to, to use a movie, negotiate with the studio for one right, and then negotiate with the actors in that movie for another right, but that three judges will tell those actors how much they get paid for acting. That's what happens with a download is that the songwriter is dictated the price, whereas the record label gets to negotiate their price. And for Google Play, they have to pay both. It may be easier to pay through one source, but they have to deal with both. So from a consumer standpoint, I think it makes it harder to innovate new business models that the consumers might want. So uh, you know, I'll give you a good example. Um, people that use Pandora Radio 
may get frustrated by the limitations of the service that seem artificial. Why can you only skip so many songs and then it doesn't let you skip anymore? Why can't I see what songs are coming up next and then go through that list and edit it so that I don't have to wait for the song to play to tell it I don't want to hear that song or I don't like it? Why can't I listen to a specific artist now instead of just telling the artists that I like and it'll recommend artists like that artist? All those limitations aren't technical limitations. They're limitations because Pandora doesn't want to become an interactive service. They want to be a non-interactive service under the law because if they're non-interactive, they can extract a compulsory license instead of having to negotiate for what they want to do. So if you want to make it so that business models can offer consumers what they want, then let's take away some of these artificial distinctions about the type of usage of the music copyright. It doesn't exist in any other place. It's not as if if you buy the movie versus if you stream and rent the movie, there are two separate government mandated price negotiations that go on for that experience. It's just a simple negotiation with one rights holder about the cost of that activity. That's where I'd like to see music go. Thanks. Does anyone else on the panel want to comment on the perhaps differences between video and music? Uh, oh, you go ahead. Okay. Um, I think I understand you, David, to be saying two, two different things. And there's one with which we violently agree, and that is that licensing music is uniquely complicated from the licensee perspective. You do have to deal with two separate intellectual property rights holders, two separate intellectual property rights in each song, and sometimes there is multiple intellectual property holders of one of one of those rights. So we have the sound recording that you get from the record companies, you have the musical composition that you get from the music publishers, and sometimes that musical uh, composition is owned by two or three or, or more, 20 you know, co-writers, co-publishers. So uh, licensing music is extraordinarily and needlessly complex, and the, uh, the result of that is s fewer legal services and less money in the hand in the pockets of rights owners that is for sure and i think that there's probably a lot I, david and i have worked over the years in in how to simp in, in ways to simplify that or navigate that and i think there are there are things that we should talk about uh there are ways that we could simplify that process by making ownership data more readily available on mass by uh potentially finding it easier to license the long tail um, if in, you know, on the composition side. Whether or not there's a compulsory rate for, the, the other thing that David is saying is that he wants to s eliminate the compulsory license for on the music publishing side. That's a separate issue. And, and you know, I think what, I, what I'm hearing David say is, you know, you'll get more support for simplifying licensing if you, get, if you support us in uh, uh, getting rid of the compulsory license. I don't, I don't you know, Compulsory license is super complicated. I, I don't need to get into it now. There are, other than to say there are important historical reasons why it exists. Um, but I, I don't think that we need to necessarily conquer that in order to simplify music licensing to bring more compelling services to more people and earn more revenue uh, for rights holders. Yeah, but, but the problem is, as you know, if you tackle licensing Right now, you have to tackle it in the different types of licenses. So you have to imply mechanical licensing. And then separately, you have to deal with performance licensing and what withdrawals yes. from PRO. And then synchronization licensing isn't governed at all. And so YouTube's challenge is they don't have a compulsory, they don't have a consent decree. There are important historical reasons why these old forms of compulsory and consent decree exist. But at least point, we're trying to enter into a new world where these are artificial. And what I'm, what I'm suggesting to try to, to marry the two parts that may seem disjointed is that I think you can make licensing easier, but only if it's not at the expense of giving up a free market negotiation over the value of, of the copyrights. So for example, if you wanted to put everything into a, into a compulsory license with rate setting, license would be easier. But for songwriters, that probably means value would go down. We wouldn't want to do that. So there's got to be some way to fix licensing without taking things out of the free market and putting them into a process that we think devalues the property. And that's what I'm suggesting is our struggle to figure out the future. David, could you have a compulsory license but not have a set rate so that the content creators set their own rate? No, because a compulsory license means you can't say no. What negotiation is fair 
when someone wants to use your property and you can't say no. It's just a question of price. And if you can't agree on a price, then ultimately someone will set the price for you because you didn't agree to it. That's the whole point. And it would be a big change in, in U.S. law if every time a new artist wanted to record a song, and it was somebody else's song, you know, wanted to record a cover song, they had to ask permission in advance to be able to do that. Or if every time a radio station wanted to play a song, they had to go through a licensing negotiation in order to do that. That would be a very big change. It would be a huge change. <laughs> and it exists in other forms of digital content, but the market has solved it. So for example, every time someone wants to make a movie, they've got to go out and negotiate the price for the actors, and they have to negotiate the price for the crew, and they have to negotiate. Mean, all that's done in a private market. Well, yeah. And there's no <laughs> government oversight into telling people how much they get paid for the activity. And ultimately, the marketplace works in that the person who bundles all those rights together has a negotiation over the price for the product. And if they agree on a price, the movie's sold. If they don't agree on a price, the owner of the movie gets to decide, I'm not selling at that price. I think the market would work through these issues if music were put on a similar playing field of other forms of intellectual property. I think it would help. Thanks. I want to move on uh, away from music for a little bit. And John, uh, let me bring you in on this. Um, one issue that comes up quite a bit is the issue of uh, pay windows. And that's something that's uh, not entirely unique to video, but it is um, something that happens more with movies and other types of uh, video content. Can you talk a little bit about the economics of this practice sure. um, and how it fits with new business models? So I, I think it, it falls under what I said before about you know experimentation and innovation. So windows are all part of that process of everybody's intent is to maximize the value of content, right? And windows are one way to do that across a number of stakeholders in the business. So I think what you're seeing today and what you're going to continue to see is experimentation in uh, windowing experimentation in um, the way content rolls out to consumers um, both in time and location and so forth and that um, that will evolve and, and again in, in, a, in a free and open innovation and experimentation model to places that maximize the value of, of content to creators and distributors. Mm -hmm. uh, Lee did you want to add anything on that? No, other than I, I was, just, I would ask, and I really maybe it's dangerous to ask because I really don't know the question, the answer. But um, is is it your suggestion then that that the windowing practices that are going on, your constituency has a definite understanding that the windowing process results in increased revenue, or is it that they're experimenting with it and we may see changes? In it? Well, I think I think you're already seeing changes because. Um, People have tried a number of different windowing approaches over the past few years. So um, I, I can't speak for for our member companies on on you know whether that is is boosting their business performance or not. But I think the experimentation um, is going to prove that out, and, and ultimately you'll end up at a place where where people are, are maximizing the value of the content. So another restriction that uh, some consumers talk about is uh, geographic restrictions on content. And uh, I mean, we've seen this where you know it's uh, sometimes content is available in certain countries and sometimes it's not. Uh, can you talk a little bit about uh, the challenges you've seen in this? Um, why is it successful in some countries? And uh, what might change to make it more successful globally? Yeah, um, I can. I just want to, one comment, one comment on windowing. Um, I just, uh, in Japan, Japan is the only country in the world where last year digital music revenue declined. And I was just looking into that a little bit, and I learned that there are, there are actually, uh, it, for most of the globe, the subscription model for music has been a massive growth story, really growing in huge millions of millions and millions of Spotify subscribers, you know, all access, um, lots of new uh, subscription services. In Japan. There are three subscription services, which collectively have about 60,000 subscribers. And in my view, the reason for that is because the, the practice in Japan is to window content in these subscription services. So the, they don't get content until they're between six and 12, until a song is released for at least six or 12 months. There's no new content in the services. And as a result, the industry is not growing. 
uh, you know, piracy is on the rise. Our view is that you need to give consumers the content that they want when they want it if we want to grow digital businesses. And I think that applies to movies as well. Um, it's uh, there, you know, it, it is frequently, if you look at the top pirated movies, they're frequently movies that are not available yet because they're still in that window. I understand that the, the overall ecosystem of you know, economics of film distribution is complicated and, and this theater, theatrical window and cable, you know, it's, it's complicated. Um, but it would be, it would definitely help digital growth if we could find a way to narrow or eliminate that window, for sure. Well, then before we move on for, uh, from windowing, uh, since, since we got into a little bit more, can you talk a little bit about the consumer benefits of that? Because it seems that, you know, there is a risk of losing some consumer benefit of having different pricing uh, <coughs> options for, you know, kind of secondary content. How can we get that same type of benefit as we move into the digital, more digital world? The, uh, this, I mean, I absolutely think that more choices, it would be one thing to say a service is cheaper because it doesn't contain the new releases, but you could pay more and get the new releases. I mean, something like that might be rational. Mm -hmm. uh, but to simply deprive people of the ability to obtain the content altogether feels like uh, a difficult choice to make in today's world. What would it take? On, on the movie side, for example, right now, there, you know, where there are still windows, to be able to have that kind of super premium, you know, would it be a licensing type challenge for you to go out there and do that, or, or what? Well, it's, what the, the, the film industry has elected not to make the films available during that, that window. But, it's but, just a decision, it's a business decision by the, the studios. But, but I would argue that if, if the market showed that, that to maximize the value of movies, that would be the approach to do, do it, that Yep. The R member companies would do that. It's the nature of digital content. Why, when a new video game is released, can they control that release so well, have lines around the corner, everyone goes and buys it when it's released as a mad rush? It's because it's not that simple to go online and steal the video game. Music and movies find themselves in a different place. You can't control the flow of the content. And so the, the desire to control the release schedule and where it goes and when, which is understandable from a copyright property owner, because again, <coughs> digital growth is great, but what you're concerned about is growth. You're concerned about bottom line. Mm -hmm. And so you see people making decisions about when they release a new album, do I put it on Spotify or not? Because if I put it on Spotify, how many people won't go buy it because they can get it on Spotify? And property owners struggle with that. What I would point out, again, is those property owners can make bad decisions. A movie studio may be wrong in windowing, but they make that decision because they own the property. Uh, a recording artist and record label, may, it may be a bad decision to withhold it from Spotify, but they can make that decision. Songwriter doesn't get to make that decision because they don't have a choice. They can't tell Spotify no. It's on Spotify whether they like it or not. I tend to agree with the point of view, we should just flood it out and make it available. I think windowing's a mistake for music and movies, I do. but. I also believe that property owners have the right to make bad decisions with their own property. We just want to delight users when they come to Google Play. <laughs> <laughs> Question? Uh, just, yeah, just one minute. Um, I just want to go back to the, the question about geographic restrictions on content. Yeah. Um, so I just want to open it up uh, for anyone that wants to respond to that. What, you know, what will it take to get, you know, because mm -hmm. as I think a number of people have noted, you know, across the board, people want to monetize the content. Yeah, and they want that out there. So, what will it take? So, this is a this is another area that I think kind of the legacy structure of the way these industries have evolved is carrying over to digital in a way that makes it really challenging to grow and expand. So, you know, I showed you the slide of how many countries we're in, uh, you know, and, and all of our music services. But don't be fooled that it was it was simple to get there. Um, I do think that there. Uh, right, right now, the way that industry is structured is there are different entities that control licensing for different territories. Um, you know, sub sub companies within larger corporations. Sometimes it's actually completely separate companies in different continents control the same piece of music or the same film. Uh, there have been some significant initiatives in Europe to simplify. It used to be in Europe you had to go country by country. It, in Europe, and we're seeing some pan-European licensing of rights owners in Europe, which is an incredibly helpful 
uh, movement in terms of getting launched in more countries faster, um, and and also some licensing hubs where, in uh, you know, one entity will represent uh, the. It's kind of like aggregation of rights of different local content into one entity. So something like Armonia, where um, I think that that is a uh, is that uh, Spain, France. I don't even yeah, he's, he's just US. Um, so we're seeing some efforts to address from a business perspective the complications of territorial licensing, but it is very complicated. And there's some unfortunate user impact. For example, you know, if I buy my music here, can I access it while I'm traveling abroad? And you know, there could be different answers to that question depending on the kind of territorial enforcement <coughs> That uh, a product uses to enforce territorial restrictions. So there's some there's some hard things to sort out, and absolutely, uh, you know, the internet is global, and I hope that we can continue to work together to find global solutions. I think the uh, the music industry, the, sorry, the recording industry, has been it's been easier to find those solutions and have some global deals with the record companies than with the music publishers. But again, that's because of historically how these rights were managed. It's not that the music publishers are, you know, are mean. <laughs> no, we do deals. We do deals where the music publishers will license everything they have an ability to license. That's literally what the agreements will say. We give you every right we have, and then you still have to go fill in pieces because of rights that aren't given that the publisher can't necessarily do directly. And so it's a real challenge. I, I was just going to say, I, I, I think that might be a little bit off what your question was asking. You, you were asking about geographically particular material, right? And I, I, if I get your question right, I think that some of what Zahaba was saying is true, that that's kind of a vestige of a, of a bygone day. Um, you know, when I used to work at record companies 15, 20 years ago, and we could effectively put two extra songs on the Japanese release of an album, and we were we could keep it out of the United States, right? Because customs would <laughs> literally stop, uh, you know, the shipment of a of a box of CDs. That's no longer the case. I I, I do think that the industry, uh, the media industries, not just music in particular, um, are taking stock of that. But again, you know, old habits die hard. Um, it's a it's a big part of why we're all here talking about this stuff. And, and I think that that old business practice of, well, I can, I can kind of earmark the release that went to France as separate from the release that occurred in the United States because the track listing is different or there's an extra song on it or whatever. I think that, that those types of practices, everybody realizes, as Zahava pointed out, the Internet is global. And, and the idea that you know people in Switzerland should have a different album version than the people in Canada is, is doesn't really make much sense going forward. Thanks. I want to open it up for questions. If you can just say your name and any Sure. I'm Bob Vastine. I'm at the Georgetown Center for Business, Business and Public Policy. And uh, it's obvious that the future of your businesses depends on global distribution. <clears throat> so naively, you mentioned global, uh, naively I'd ask um, what what is the major obstacle? What or, or set of obstacles? Maybe this is too big a question, because but I'm very naive about it. Um, that that stands in the way of your maximizing your global reach. So for Google, it is uh, it is licensing. There are other issues when you go global, right? You need to support local forms of payment. You need to for support local currencies, address local tax laws. So there's it's complicated. Uh, you have to make sure that you're showing what's available in that country, that you stock the shelves with locally relevant content. So there's a lot that's involved, the, the digital shelves, you know. Uh, there's a lot that's involved in rolling out globally. But for us across the board, I think it's fair to say the number one obstacle is licensing impediments. Google is a global company. There's a lot. We have absolutely a desire for all of the verticals we showed you to be available globally and would do that, you know, much faster. If licensing wasn't an impediment. Any other questions in the room? So let's talk about the business models a little bit because there's Could you other. Talk louder, please. Uh, I was going to ask about the business models as the digital content grows. You either have the customer pays, the the pr provider pays through some sort of a cross thing, 
or the um, advertiser pays, I think you pay he pays. So which do you see, uh, I mean, I guess maybe what, how does Google Plus uh, start for its business model, for example, and how do the other industries uh, see that evolving uh, away from, there was a pretty famous quote from the head of NBC a number of years ago, where he said he didn't want to swap uh, uh, analog dollars for digital pennies. And I sort of wonder why in the age of targeted advertising, you can't see those rates sort of equalize a little bit. So maybe you can talk about that. Um, so Google has all three of the models that you uh, uh, mentioned. So for example, YouTube is an ad-supported model. Um, we have customer pay. We have customer pay models for uh, our digital store and our digital music subscription service. And then Google subsidizes the cost of uh, our locker service, which enables users to upload their music to the cloud. And we do that because we believe that people that use their uh, devices to access their own personal music collections are more likely to buy and we're trying to encourage sales and make money that way. So we have all three models. We think that there are multiple, we, that there are a lot of different people that want to consume their content in different ways and we'd like to appeal to, to everybody. Um, I, I, think that, I think that was a question. <laughs> I, I think I would answer it the same way. You know, it, it's everybody is is exploring all of the revenue models. I don't think anybody really knows yet. You know how that mix is ultimately going to play out. And frankly, it, it's not going to end at one point. It's point. It's going to continue to change and evolve. Yes. Yeah. Hi, I'm John Birdmeyer with Public Knowledge. Um, you know, with some notable exceptions, uh, a lot of the digital content stores I see tend to be part of larger businesses, like they're being cross-subsidized. For example, the Play Store being part of the Android business unit, it seems to be part of Google's Android strategy, or iTunes being sort of, you know, subsidized by Apple's hardware sales, or Amazon, you know, its media, its digital media being part of its larger retail operation. I'm wondering, you know, what, what is the future for just a, a pure standalone digital content only business because some of the ones that are pretty famous seem to uh, struggle financially, you know, Pandora or, uh, or RDO. Uh, I think they're, they're interesting services, but I don't, you know, they don't appear to be as sound on a sound of financial footing as the ones that are subsidized or part of other businesses. I, I don't think from a perspective of a songwriter or music publisher, we care. <laughs> I, I think that we would be supportive of any business model that would would, would try to pay and I, and I would I mean there are examples on both sides but I would point out that kind of the large corporation that runs a music service as part of it whether it be Google or Apple or Amazon we've mostly negotiated our way through problems whereas others like Pandora I think has a particular track record of trying to litigate trick gimmick legislate its way into profitability as opposed to being a good business partner so I, I don't have a particular preference for whether it's a subsidiary or not. I would just prefer that they uh, try to figure out a way to be business partners because that's really what it should be. <laughs> Question, uh, Andres Jordan, Factor Six, I advise companies on media and digital strategies. Um, the way there's so much content being loaded on networks, and I come from a technology background. Um, and inevitably, the issue of discovery and relevance is going to come to play, right? So at some point, all of us here are contributing to somebody's video and making it to somebody else's phone. Do you see a world where everybody here should get compensated for that relevance? Just throwing it out there. Uh, you know, because that's that's the way things are evolving, right? It's, it's all about relevance. It's all about my friend told me to watch this and all this and all that. Um, and I'm just curious if you ever thought about it that way. Uh, just throwing it out there as a blue sky question. I, I'm not sure I completely understand the question. Are you saying that people should be uh, possibly participating in revenue based on suggestions or recommendations, or are you saying that they should participate in revenue because there is a, a ever-growing user-generated content marketplace? Yeah, a little bit of both. I mean, look at Facebook, right? Uh, I mean, Facebook uses all of our creative energy to, to derive incredible amounts of revenue. And yet we do it willingly without realizing the consequences of what we're doing, right? I mean, you put up a, a picture on, on Facebook and it's theirs. Uh, most people don't know that, right? But uh, so at some point, everybody is everybody's, is, is tapping into our, into our you know, call it human energy to, to promote the latest movie. Is there a way, and I'm not saying we should all get paid, but is there a, at least an acknowledgement that there is this 
us promoting this stuff, right? Any comments from Google? <laughs> hey, I, I think friends recommending you know music and and movies is something that is has predates the internet. Um, you know, I think that's a, a just part of social life together. Uh, there there are programs such as affiliate programs. Um, and and we're actually working on one right now. I probably shouldn't be talking about it yet, but <laughs> uh, where if 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 somebody's recommendation actually results in a direct sale, right? Then then we might uh, com compensate. Or Amazon has this live. Amazon and iTunes both have something like this live, right? Where if you're a website and you're maybe talking about, or let's say you're a movie studio, you're a, you're a, a, a record label, and you have you control the websites for all your artists. And then you link to iTunes or Amazon or Google Play uh, for users who go to that website to buy the song, right? You could say by promoting that sale, by offering the buy link there, um, you know, that website deserves something. You know, I think that if you're a, a, an influential blogger and you want to talk about your favorite movies and your favorite uh, songs and want to put affiliate links, you know, I think there is a model in place today that would enable you to be compensated for the sales that result from that. Yes. Andrea De Silva, International Trade Administration with the Commerce Department. I'd like to hear from all four of you. Um, so consumer is king. The consumer is really driving uh, the, the digital content space. And uh, PricewaterhouseCoopers in their annual entertainment and media outlook they're talking extensively this year about how the CEOs are basically convening around what does the consumer want and how do we feed that to them. So my question to you is not so much on the money making side of it because we've heard you talk about that. How are you engaging consumers on uh, piracy and on policy including your interesting idea of a single license and could that engagement possibly lead to changes in how consumers are consuming and possibly an increase in legal consumption of creative content, whether it be music or all the other industry segments. I'd like to hear from each one, but I don't know if time permits. Well, I'll just say quickly that I think the nature again of music and some other forms of intellectual property is such that, that you no longer can control it. And so the trick is to figure out how can you monetize what the consumer wants. I mean, if you were to ask what the consumer wants, they want any music they want, whenever they want it, and they want it for free. And they don't want to be bothered with the commercials, by the way. <laughs> Which is the only way to really You're make that money. kind of a model work anyway. So it's a struggle to figure out giving them what they want, but monetizing it. And one of the things that I think is inhibiting giving the best consumer experience that has the best chance of monetization in a proper way is to have it be a service that breaks down barriers that exist. So if you want to feel like ownership, have your folders in the cloud that you can put things in and you feel like they're yours and you own them. If you want a jukebox, you can play whatever you want when you want. And if you, if you don't want to think a radio service is personalized for you, will tailor it to you. That can be done, and someone may be willing to pay $9.99 a month for that better than stealing individual download songs or just listening to commercial-filled radio, but we create barriers to prevent that next great service from happening. But how are you engaging the consumer, is the question. Engaging the consumer? I mean, the consumers have already kind of moved on this, so they, they access music however they want, whenever they want anyway. It doesn't really matter. All we're trying to do is catch up with what they want, but do it in a legal way. And I mean, I think Lee and Zahav and I are, and, and others have all been partners in trying to figure that out because they're competing with these illegal services too. I mean, Lee has companies that are members that are either charging or having to make you listen to advertisements that they're having to compete with a service that is purely illegal. So it's, it's both of our challenges. And, and I think on, on the movie side, what we found is if, if you talk to consumers, consumers want to find free, non-infringed content. And so part of part of our challenge is, is helping them do that. And the website I mentioned before, wheretowatch.org, 
gives them a chance to find the content they want in a legal form, and and that you know is is a way that we think helps this problem. It's about making compelling legal services convenient for users, and that's you know I think the initiative that I talked about with both YouTube and, and Google Play. That's what it's all about. It needs to be right there, easily easily searchable, easily discoverable, easily purchasable, easily consumed. All of those things. It's key. I I, I would I would simply phrase it in a way that I, I hope gets more to answering the question directly. What we're it, that is a ancillary benefit of what we've been talking about uh, a lot up here, which is you know easing licensing, therefore streamlining the ability to populate to to launch and populate a service with all of that content that consumers want. Um, not only does it help you know David's constituents and John's constituents that to to make money, but what we see is consumers would a actually gravitate towards legal content when it's available, as opposed to illegal content. Um, and as John pointed out, uh, it's true that consumers want to get it for free, and, and David pointed this out too. But I believe it's important to note that consumers want to get it if it feels free. Um, and that's a part of what we talk about when, you know, it, it's part of the, the business model of advertising, but if they don't want advertising, there's all kinds of potential things that you can do, like uh, possibly bundling the cost of, a, say, a music service or a movie service with, with internet access or with your cable service provider or your cellular, cellular provider. But I think really what we're talking about is that's that's a secondary benefit of what we're talking about. Not only will it open up a marketplace and allow <coughs> content owners to be paid, but the, the second great benefit is it necessarily <coughs> reduces piracy. Uh, before we move on, uh, Zahab, I don't know if you know this statistic or maybe someone else, but you mentioned at the beginning that uh, 25 to 34 percent of digital content, of, of revenue is for digital content um, for, these, uh, in, for this area. Do you know what percentage of that is ad supported? Uh, I uh, so I said in, for music, music in 2012, in the U.S., 51 percent, uh, over 50 percent, somewhere I don't know, Carrie probably knows, 57 percent or something was uh, uh, from digital sources, and I think 34 percent globally. Oh, globally, okay. Yeah, I don't know. I last I checked, sales still comprise the majority of revenue vis-a-vis -vis subscription services, but subscription services are growing much faster. Does that sound consistent? Yeah, so yeah we're at 59 in 2012, we're well into the 60s now for digital revenue. In the U.S., yeah. And is it still the case that digital sales is comprises a, a, the majority of that and subscription is uh, it's growing, but yeah. not, not still not as not Subscription as and streaming was 15% in 2012, yeah, there and you. that's Gone, that was from 9% the year before. It's growing very quickly. Yeah. Right. Carrie Sherman is the president of the RIAA. So she's <laughs> Thank That's, you. But the, gro the growth in the activity doesn't match the same growth in the revenue. And that's, that's the big challenge, is that the services may grow, but it doesn't mean it's replacing the sales model that used to exist. And, and that's really what the music industry struggles with. Uh, yes, hey, Jonathan McHale, Office of the U.S. Trade Rep. Um, you mentioned the anomaly of having two separate rights and having to negotiate two separate through two separate um, groups. Being a U.S. problem, U.S. judges solve this problem. Is that other, has any other country solved this issue? And is another country a model for where, where you want to head? Well, no, other countries have the same challenge. Um, it, it's different in this country in some ways, but. It, take a synchronization service, you know, like a YouTube, they, in every country they would have to go through separate negotiations for the publishing rights and for the sound recording rights for, for to monetize what they want to do. So it's not a U.S. unique problem. But what about the price control piece? Well, the price control piece in some ways can be worse in other countries. Um, you have, a, you have a, some unique factors in the United States. One of the things that I think is, is a big challenge is that in most other countries you have one performance society. So you go to one place and it tends to be regulated. In the United States you have three, two major ones that take up the bulk, but by law they're not regulated. It's only because of these consent decrees. And so if you could figure out how to empower them to operate 
in a marketplace where they do a very good job of licensing and of negotiating and collecting rights, they're just inhibited by these consent decrees. That, that to me, is a model of the way forward. You still choose which one you join, so there's competition among them. Um, it becomes less of a bureaucratic problem, but figure out how they can operate in the market. Are there any other questions for the panel? Uh, well, with that, I, I have one last uh, question that we can end on um, because we, we kind of started off talking about some of the consumer benefits. So I'll just ask each panelist, um, in your opinion, what's been the biggest uh, success in the digital market for content to date? And uh, you can't say Google Play. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> okay, you YouTube. Can, you can say that one besides Google Play. <laughs> uh, the, but do you mean a specific service? Just what, what do you think is it? What is it merge? <laughs> what, what do you think is it merge as a as a consumer benefit in this space? Yeah, I I think the the benefit is be is the convenience of being able to access what you want from wherever you are. It's the it's the you hear it on the radio. Oh my God, I love that. Bye. I think it, um, that's the it's it's the instant gratification. <laughs> I think we've turned a corner on arguing, in, in many cases, about arguing about the existence of rights, and we've moved to now negotiating the value of rights, which is a big step forward. And so I, I think it's a good thing when big internet players get into the space of music. I love that Google wants to sell music. I love that Amazon wants to sell music. I love that <coughs> Facebook and Twitter want to monetize their video sites that have music in them, because I think that will be the best way to try to replace the lost income from the changing consumer habits. So it's just business partnerships with very large players where we're discussing terms instead of discussing do we need rights or not. Thank you, David. Uh, in keeping with the music theme, I, I would kind of just build a little bit upon what David was saying. And I, I would say it's the, uh, it's the relatively recent willingness for record companies and music publishers to to at least move on a voluntary basis towards what David has been talking about uh, all along here in licensing more rights uh, than they necessarily have to under any particular statutory regime and voluntarily coming to agreements with digital services uh, to allow them to try to experiment a little bit with a lot of the various business models that Google Play and others have, have tried to, uh, are continuing to work with. Um, it, that's encouraging. It, I, I think it has to continue. And I think it's all about the consumer. Consumers now have much more access to content. It's better quality content. It's across all the devices that they want to use. It's in all the places that they want to consume content. And that is just a really compelling consumer model. Great. Hey, did you? Uh, yeah, just one more thing. In addition to the, the convenience of access, yeah, it's the, the scope of choice in what content is available, right? There was never a record store that could stock 18, you know, that as many millions of albums as Google Play or iTunes stock, which enables people to to, you know, to access virtually anything in print or no longer in print. I mean, it's pretty incredible the choice, the consumer choice that digital enables. Great. Well, thank you, and, and thanks to everyone for joining us today. And please join me in thanking our panel.